What is the condition of free speech in America today? I'm Sanford Unger, director of the Free Speech Project at Georgetown University. On this video series, Speaking Freely, we're talking from time to time with thought leaders and players in the free speech drama unfolding in America. Today, Andrew Sullivan, writer at large for New York Magazine, joins us in the studio. Andrew Sullivan, what do you think of the lessons of those pretty horrifying events in Charlottesville in August of 2017? Well, I think you have to distinguish between the various events. It was kind of complicated. Um, from the, what happened the next day, you know, the, the killing of, of, of the, the, the woman and I mean, Heather, what's her last name? Heather Heyer. I Heather Heyer, that's right. Um, and the, what I think, somewhat farcical, to be honest with you, tiki, torch-carrying bunch of losers that created this spectacle um, that is obviously, I mean, self-evidently disgusting beyond any human perspective, but also not exactly a mass movement. I mean, you know, they're, they're not on the evidence presented Not the evidence there. that we can, there or that we can, re, you know, there aren't other marches happening with many more anywhere. In fact, they've tried to replicate it and they've managed to get like 30 or 40 people to well, show there, up. Well, there are people say, who say there are some websites, there are oh, some yeah, online Oh, yeah, 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 online, yes, absolutely. They're thousands and thousands yeah, of people. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. true. But it doesn't mean that they're marching down the streets like Nazis and, no. and, and intimidating people physically on a large scale, right. which is, of course, what happened with, with neo-fascism, with fascism. I mean, right. it, was a, it was a street, a very street and physical movement. In, in, in Weimar Germany. Yes. Right, right. Uh, and so Charlottesville is troubling, though, because of, uh, I think, a number of things are troubling about it. One is that the police sort of stepped back and didn't enforce some things that might have prevented deaths and injuries and kept things under control. Um, but also this sort of um, cheap uh, hate speech that, that seemed to find an atmosphere in which it could flourish there. It, it clearly didn't find much of an atmosphere outside the not outside 400 event. people, and they came yeah. from all over the country. So I'm not sure right. there was anything in Charlottesville that created this moment. Right. Um, you know, I'm struggling what to think about it. Um, there's no question that there is a rise uh, in reactionaryism across the world, that, that at a period of, of extraordinary demographic change, along with the sure. culture and economics, there is a quite predictable and not exactly surprising retrenchment uh, across the world in favor of more traditional uh, ethno states which have been the overwhelming norm right. in human history until the last 50 years. But it might be very hard to preserve now. It might be, it also, there's, but there's a, it's still an open <coughs> question as to whether the alternative is viable. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's, what deep, that's the deep worry underlying all this is that in fact, We've only lived in these multicultural societies at the, at the degree and uh, variety in which we currently live for maybe 30 or 40 years. That's right, at most. In the history of humankind, that's a blip. Right. Uh, and so far as we can see what's now happening to the Western multicultural democracies, they're all in some sort of spasm of identity, uh, which is uh, with enormous amounts of panic and cultural anxiety and and self-harm as a response to it. You look at, I'm just looking at my own home country, Britain, where they're committing economic national suicide right. because they just can't handle the pace of change. And, you know, I, I'm not in favor of the <laughs> economic suicide, which is, or, or the, the, right. the destruction of Britain as an international force, 
But uh, I do think it was naive to think you could have this massive change overnight without some kind of reaction to it. I mean, I think that was... And when that reaction happens, not to see it as some sort of obvious, predictable human response. So the change you're talking about is the, the sort of decline of the old order, the, the orderly ethno-state, and this uh, seemingly, in some places in Europe, and Trump would say here, out of control uh, multicultural surge. Well, let me give you a statistic which kind of staggered me when I first uh, read it. Um, in the year 2015, more people immigrated into the British Isles than had immigrated in the entire period from 1066 to 1950. Wow. That is staggering. It, it's, it is staggering. I mean, this is a huge uh, demographic bulge that they're dealing with. Projections now of the British future population are somewhere around 80 to 90 million. They may overtake the Germans because there's been such a huge influx into the country. And it's not that big a country. It's relatively small. It's never had to absorb close to a million new people a year. Uh, and, you know, when the British see, you know, my family members voted for Brexit, so I, I can see this up front. And when they, when they, they notice these, are, you can call this racism if you want. Go ahead. Um, but when the most popular boy's name in Britain, baby boy's name now, is Muhammad, uh, you, you can't expect, certainly people definitely of the older generations, not to feel this disorienting and unsettling. Um, so we can expect an upheaval. Yeah. And we can expect speech to reflect that yes, upheaval. absolutely. And stepping from Britain to the U.S. where it has different character, different ramifications, what are the implications here for speech? They are that we are going to be hearing a lot more radical speech right. on all sides. Um, uh, you know, along the rise of white nationalism in this country, you've also had uh, a sort of new black nationalism um, in which white people are inherently suspect. Uh, I mean, you, you can see that in the work of someone like ta Coates, mm -hmm. who's now the most important intellectual for the, for the liberal left in the country. Uh, and the goal of a free society is not to panic at this, to, to allow this to actually take its course. It's, it's, uh, it's a natural phenomenon in the, in, in the context of this kind of social change. It's going to result in some horrible things. Uh, it may even result in disasters like the Trump presidency or Brexit. But it's, it's not as if, without that context, if you have no idea of that context or history or demographics, and you just suddenly see people being racist, you can jump to the wrong conclusions. You, right. you, you can overreact to what is happening. And, and, and there seems to be an inability of some people to understand that humans are not that good a species, <laughs> you know, that, that, that we're, we're, we're not good people. And, and, and attempting to make sure that everybody is virtuous all the time and aren't that's expressing. Very, that's a very difficult assignment. It is. But, and and it, it, what it does, if you're not careful, in my opinion, is it actually increases the power of what you're resisting. Uh, I mean, it could be a, there could be, a, by pushing it back very far and past, you may get a worse response. That's my concern. That by telling Trump voters you're racists and bigots right. uh, and privileged to boot, uh, you're not actually going to get them to weaken their attitudes. You're going to get them to double down on them. Sure. And they're not, it's not just going to go away. And if you try to shut them up and, and they don't have outlets, it will go underground and it will It will thrive. get even worse. Right. And it has gotten even worse partly because of that. I mean, you, the alt-right's emergence online is, especially among the young, is, I think, some sort of response to the, to the increasing sense they're not allowed to say what they're feeling. Right. So one of the symptoms seems to be that a character like Richard Spencer, um, I've never met him, have you? No, thank God. Yeah. Uh, he seems to have a cachet. He, he doesn't drool, and so he, he knows how to speak in a polite society. He has an office in Old Town Alexandria. Suit and tie. Uh, out of which he operates, right, suit and tie. So he decides, I want to go to the University of Florida. And the University of Florida, 
for its whatever. Well, he didn't, he didn't decide that, right? He gets invited. No, he was not invited oh, to really? the University of Florida. Oh, really? Huh. University of Florida is one of several examples where the university and the state have no regulations to prevent him from coming and, on the contrary, have an obligation if he wants to rent a public facility on a public university campus, have an obligation to... Okay, that's interesting. If he can I, pay the freight, they have an obligation to rent it to him. So he comes, invited by no one. Uh, everyone panics. The president of the university panics. The governor panics, calls a state of emergency so he can ship in more police, more people to uh, help protect everyone on all sides. And when he gets there, people start to shout him down. Uh, they turn their backs, they hold up signs, they prevent him from being heard until he finally gives up. Now, when we pick that incident apart, who's right and who's wrong, and, and what are the lessons for the next time it, it happens? Uh, is it true, or is it reasonable to argue, as many college and university presidents do, that you must never disrupt someone's speech, that uh, whether invited or not, self-invited, you have to hear him out. That's the American way, to hear him out. And so then, who gets arrested or uh, gets in trouble are the people trying to interrupt Richard Spencer. And there's no, there's no evidence to believe that Richard Spencer has any sort of constituency at the University of Florida. He might, he might not, we don't know, but we don't think so. But it's the people who try to stop him from talking who get into trouble. Well, that's an interesting case. I, I, would, um, I, I would draw a distinction between disrupting speech and shutting it down. Uh, and I think that's an important Explain distinction. That. Yeah. Well, heckling, protesting, even you know, the quip that comes across in the middle of someone's speech from the audience that completely, completely uh, demolishes an argument or, or makes a point with humor that that completely disarms people right. and makes the speaker's point less plausible or credible. That's, that is speech. And, you know, democratic speech, is, especially in public and debates, has been full of that stuff since sure. time immemorial. And it's kind of important, I think, to defend that. On the other hand, if the goal is not to counter and to disrupt or to protest in some way or to chip away at his speech, but to actually prevent him saying anything at all, then I think you go into a different dynamic. Now, that's a hard line Sure, it's a very hard police. line to draw. It is. Uh, my, I wrote something on it out of thinking out loud about this. That, that, uh, so for example, if Charles Murray goes to Middlebury, it seems to me perfectly legitimate for them to chant and hold up signs for 15 minutes or so, uh, at which point, there is an understanding that he's allowed to speak. Uh, but when the whole point of it is to render certain thoughts and ideas impermissible, then you're, then you're actually, you've, tipped, you've gone over that particular line. I know that's a difficult line to police. And if I thought the goal of the protesters was to expose the fallacies or, or pomposities or <laughs> flaws in the man's speech, I would, you know, there's no question whatsoever that it's a legitimate thing. But they weren't about that, actually, at Middlebury, and they aren't about that in other places. They are simply saying, this must not be heard. Right. They are saying this, to hear this, to tolerate this, to sponsor it, demeans us. Yes, and also harms people. others right. in some Way that psychological harm. some psychological harm, which is you know one's always psychologically harmed when proven wrong right. about something. It's you know <laughs> I don't like finding that I've made an error you know in right. my writing. Well, or I something. don't know if they're being proven wrong, but they're being challenged in a way that they find insulting and in some cases well more demeaning. than that because the argument actually is that he's destroying the lives of minorities. He's leading to the deaths of minorities. Um, uh, as you know, in the in the in the spectrum of oppression and victimhood that the left currently has. Now, that only makes sense if you really do believe that your life is determined and affected and defined by your racial, gender, uh, socioeconomic, and 
almost endlessly proliferating so, so possible is, victimhood. So if you don't subscribe to that essentially Marxist analysis of what makes people's lives worth living and, and what, what meaning their lives have, then of course it doesn't harm anybody. But if you buy that, of course speech, but Marxism has never defended free speech. Obviously harm is... No, that's right. So, so it's important to make a distinction between using liberalism and free speech to counter bad speech and to come from a worldview in which all speech is essentially harm by anybody who is in any way above you in this hierarchy of oppression. Um, and that, and therefore, it's just violence. That speech is the violence. The speech is violence. Yes. The speech is the equivalent of violence. It's tantamount They actually violence. don't even say that. They say it, it is, is violence. It, it is then they violence. go one stage further and say, uh, white silence is violence. Which is one of the big, one of the big slogans you'll hear on White campus. White silence is in, violence in response to, in in response to the systemic oppression right. that exists all around us, right. in which white people are particularly complicit. Right. For people to be silent about that, not to actually actively endorse this agenda, is a form of is violence. Well, this is so inimicable to any understanding of free speech because it's inimicable to liberalism, more generally speaking, which is a particular intellectual construct that's right. only existed that, for you know, a few hundred years at most. It um, counts upon a constant exchange of ideas. Yes, because we're all yeah. actually understood to be equal reasonable beings, right. in which right. reason is our fundamental thing in common, and in which anybody can have a better argument at any time, or right. worse argument. But I suppose part of the, one of the, one of the uh, counters to that is that it's not a level playing field, that some people are more likely to be heard than others, that some people uh, don't, their voices are not heard, and so therefore they react, perhaps overreact, to hearing the ideas of but those who are But they're not responding by making an argument. Yeah. They're responding by shutting down shutting somebody's down. ability to right. speak. That is the critical difference here. But now, at the same time, you say that shouting down or turning your back or holding up signs or uh, interrupting the speech of Spencer at University of Florida, Charles Murray at Middlebury, and some other places, that up to a point, that is free speech too, yeah. that disruption. That's why I'm opposed to the Wisconsin, uh, the University of Wisconsin proposal, uh, in which all disruption right. itself is, is, is regarded as a, a a, 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 a some sort of right. violation. Well, of, that that is becoming yeah. a, a, a popular way for embattled, overwhelmed college and university administrators to deal with things. And in fact, some state legislatures are passing laws saying you must expel, suspend, punish students who disrupt speakers. Which, of course, the last thing we need is for state legislatures to tell us. Right. How and to, again, it's. It's very complicated what disrupt can mean. Look, I, I, right. I grew up in the Oxford Union. Right. So when I think of the debates there and the rules that apply, yes, heckling can come and people can suddenly burst out laughing and the speaker is reduced to tears, well, <laughs> just internally anyway. Morally um, common, yeah. But also when you want to interrupt someone in the mid-speech, and this happens also in the parliament, um, they, you don't have automatic interruption. But you do have a form in which you stand up and stand up there and wait and, and as to point out to the speaker that you, have a, you want to say something to object to that particular point. And in, in those traditions, the speaker, the speaker has a choice. Do I allow this person, do I sit down and let this person actually speak and then respond? Or do I continue on, ignore these people, and, and look to the rest of the crowd as if I'm just ducking right. an important question? So that's a, that's a way in which the liberal tradition of, of, of parliamentary debate allows for this, this thing. Some um, give and take. Which some little give and take. Which diffuses some of the tension around it. Yes. And I think, uh, so for example, I think it's, it should be possible for a, 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 a group of students who have completely different views of the speaker for one part of them to actually use this beginning of the speech or to disrupt and to make a statement, and then to let the speaker make his or her case, and then to have to and fro questions and so on and so forth. I think that's win-win. But, but that only matters, it only counts if the people protesting are really doing it for that purpose 
and if they haven't bought into the underlying ideology, right. which is that the speech itself is someone's being hurt right now in front of me, physically hurt. Um, therefore, this must be stopped as if I'm watching a crime take place. Right. That is, you know, that you have to understand the intellectual underpinnings of this. It is because these students are being taught in these colleges by neo-Marxists who really don't believe in speech at all. And that is now the framework for the entire college. In other words, if you are black, if you are Latino, if you have some, if you are gay, if you're whatever, you, you belong in this particular special category because you're constantly in, in danger of being violated, um, then of course the attitude towards speech is going to be completely different. Yeah, well, you and I might disagree on the extent and the extremity of this, but it is certainly taking place in in many institutions. It's, 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 it's as far as I can see, it's about. endemic. So now, what is there some moderate solution, some compromise where you say, look, um, there are some people in the room who want to hear what this person is saying. Um, so we, we've got it. We've got your message that this is, you don't approve, you don't, but we're not going to give you a heckler's veto on his or her opportunity to speak. How do we work that out? I mean, how do we, how do we? Well, as I said, I would, I would, if I were in a college, I'd say, okay, 15 minutes. <laughs> Up for 15 minutes, you can do whatever the hell you like. You can vent your protest. You can, you can state very clearly to the world you don't approve of this person being here, but you believe this and this and this about this person, and this and this and about the ideas he's about to put. And then you sit down. And then does that defend the right of other people to hear what yes. the speaker says? And, and where's, sometimes it comes where's down the some... right to hear in our, in our intellectual framework? It's not in the First Amendment, the right to hear. No, but it's, it's, it's sort of implied within it. I mean, if, you, if you're giving us free speech in the middle of a forest where no one can hear you, is it free speech? Not really. No. Um, but if that's the easiest free speech, to be sure, won't be disrupted. Yes. <laughs> you might have occasional bird song, but right. that's it. But no one's hearing it. So it's not speech, right. really, in the, in the understanding of liberal democracy. Um, so... Yes, uh, the fact that in Boston, you know, these hand, literally handful, maybe 12 or 13 of these poor people showed up on this little bandstand surrounded by a crowd of 200,000 who were kept at 200 yards distance and they did not have even any, any uh, loudspeaker system. They were this that is, disorganized. This is a week after the big Charlottesville yes. events of yes, uh, yes. August. Uh, because look, if you are a free speecher, you are going to allow the white supremacist his moment, just as you're going to allow the Marxist or the his moment. There is always, and that I is think a, that's a pretty well accepted principle, as appalling and, and and as heinous as some of that speech might be. I think maybe in since America, it's, it's in kind America. of still accepted, right. but it's obviously under. Under, profound under erosion, siege. and around yes. the world and the history of mankind, it's a completely outrageous idea. So, Richard Spencer, to come back to the sort of extreme example, and I think some of us are, could be accused of being obsessed with Richard Spencer with the, the sort of extreme I'm example. I'm bored silly by him myself, well, but anyway, go on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who wants to give this nobody this amount of right. exposure? Well, I that's, mean, a good, that's a fair point. So say some guy, some, some neo-fascist or white supremacist or racist or anti-Semitic. Well, let's talk, or about, let's talk about someone on the far left. You know, someone who's arguing that white people are inherently evil. Well, all right. I, I, either case, um, we we could say it's funny how there's no protest of that. Oh, I think there campuses. is. I think there is. I think there's protest of that. It doesn't get. You have to much protest attention. every class. <laughs> well, there's a lot of classes. Well, again, in you and I don't agree on the extent of this, but but uh, I think there's plenty of uh, protest of of doctrinaire uh, teaching speaking that doesn't allow for another side that assumes every there's a single answer to every question and it's just a matter of reciting I don't see it any, back. I don't see any evidence of the protest against that at all on campuses. Well I'll have to off Show camera me some I'll have to provide you with some examples of it. It does it does say I mean there are there are some cases that um, again they're not as well publicized but there's a faculty member at Princeton who gave a commencement address at Hampshire College in uh, Massachusetts and who 
there were some cell phone videos taken of her and she had death threats and she was told she'd better not speak and she had to cancel speeches and because what did she say well she was because she insulted Donald Trump in her particular case and and uh, well, that's not what I'm talking about I understand <laughs> you're talking about something more profound than yeah I'm than talking about Trump, right? you know people whose neo marxism defines their worldview and they're in a liberal university which is a repudiation of that worldview okay well we have to gone. right yeah. um, but I do, my, I, I'm going to insist that that's incredibly important. You can't understand what's happening in the free speech debates on campus without understanding the entire structure of the university is designed to foment a certain ideology. In based some, around identity. Well, the identity, the, what's led to identity politics has, has ultimately been very harmful, I would agree with that when everyone must be defined by a, a, a very specific identity rather than But that's not a choice ideas. on campus. Well, I think it is a choice on some campuses. And I think, it's, I think some campuses are genuinely fighting to try to establish that, making, making decent efforts to try to do it. But it's not easy in some places. And, and the, uh, I, I, I think there are people who are trying to reach some kind of compromise between speech and inclusion and inclusion is a sort of soft word that doesn't have to mean the extreme that you're talking about. It, no, and if it were a liberal sense of inclusion, I'd be in favor of it, but it right. isn't. Well, I think that's what some people right. are fighting to do. And uh, God bless them. <laughs> Good luck. So what about some of the public debates over, um, uh, there are some cases before the courts, there are some things being debated. Uh, is is uh, the the bakers the florists the do, what are what is your view on whether a bakery is required to bake a cake for the wedding to to sell a cake bake and sell a cake for the wedding of two of a same sex couple for example I have a very basic response to that is that anybody trying to force somebody to do something that violates their conscience is unacceptable to me. It, it, it violates my core understanding of what a human, a free human being is. And I am ashamed of my fellow gays and lesbians for attempting to do this to people. And why are they attempting to do it? What are, what are they? It's, it's to establish their legitimacy? Is that it's, the it's, a, it's, it's payback. It's you've oppressed us for all these years, we're now going to oppress so no. you. And your religious belief is not a religious belief, it's just bigotry. So we're going to shut it down. And the assault on religious freedom is absolutely integral to the assault on free speech. Uh, there are people who are no longer allowed to speak out loud the Christian Orthodox position on homosexuality, for example, as if that is inherently bigoted. Whereas it is actually rooted in an understanding of natural law that you can inquire into and talk about. And, and it's there. It's not, and it's been the, you, you it's been the norm for all of human existence. civilization, of all right. the major religions, of all the major societies, except for the last 15 to 20 years. And suddenly, that is hate speech? I mean, this, it's unbelievable intolerance from the left. And it, for those who say, but the bake shop, the florist shop, is a public accommodation. And under the 1964 Civil Rights Act, everyone has an equal access to that public if, accommodation. If a bake shop said, no gay, we're not serving any gays, that seems to me to be a pretty clear violation of that. If the cake shop says, we'll sell anything to any gay person, but I don't want to write uh, on the cake as a form of my own self-expression that I endorse what's happening. I'd just like not to do that. And you have other people you can go to to do that if you want. So just buy my cake and get someone else to, to do the right. Yeah, you could do that. None of, again, the, these cases of alleged discrimination are so tiny. They're not anti-gay. They're just people saying, I don't feel comfortable being a party to this thing that I don't believe in. Now, if, why would anybody want to force somebody to do that? I just don't get it unless it is an act of intolerance. And as for florists, I mean, I would just say this. You can't find a gay florist anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> you can go to the smallest town in America, you'll find a gay florist, and you have to like, find the straight one who's evangelical and make them do what they really don't want to do. The whole thing smacks of complete illiberalism and intolerance. And it's, 
I, I just I despair. I mean, one of the reason, arguments that those of us in the marriage equality movement made uh, was that you know we just want to be equal. We don't want to we don't we want to live in peace. We just want the same civil rights, and you get to do and believe what you want to get to do and believe, and we do too. Well, that sounds very reasonable. Well, that's liberalism. Yeah. I think that's what but that's not what we're hearing today. That's not right. what the LGBTQRSTUVWXYZ plus three movement now means. <laughs> it means you conform to our understanding of the world, so or we will use the law to attack you. Is that a passing phase? Is that, is that something that, that happens until there's a general sense of equality, general sense of acceptance? There's an amazing general sense of acceptance right now uh, of gay people. I mean, there's been a staggering change. Well, actually, the, years. The, the change that seems to have led to the Supreme Court decision about marriage equality was quite dramatic and, and, and in context, pretty rapid. Extremely rapid. Sudden, you could say. And the idea that those people who feel left behind by this and who are clearly losers in this culture war, the idea that we should turn around after that and penalize them some more. That's why we have Trump as president. These people feel like they're despised and being attacked. Their religious freedoms. Now, whether that's, you know, whether they're overreacting, which I think they are in many cases. I mean, I don't think people wanted to shut down churches, but you increasingly find in the, let's say, the blue side of the equation, the notion that any religious faith is a form of mental illness anyway. And, and it's as bad as bigotry being a Christian. It's bad, it's bad as being a racist being a Christian. I mean, I used to go to college campuses and have to tell them I'm openly gay, and there's a big gasp. Now I, go to, now I go to campuses and say I'm openly Christian, and you'd think I declared myself a mass murderer. Uh, and I think those people... I think there are campuses where you could go and you wouldn't be treated that way. I... People, people are genuinely shocked that someone can actually openly say I, I'm a Christian. I mean, my hyperbole notwithstanding, there is a sense of, what? Christian? And, you know, it's, and I, I, I'm not sure it's going to get better because I think that the, again, an entire generation is being brought up with this understanding. And you don't think it's a phase like any other, that when there's more civility about conversation around some of these things, that when uh, there seems to be better, <laughs> the word communication seems paltry to use in this context, but you don't, you don't have any hope at all that, that there can be some... Well, the paradox is that we've made that. We've made all those advances. It is more civil. Yes. It's taken for granted. So why then does one side, the winning side, seek then to rub it in? That's, that's, well, that's the question. that's never a good idea. No. I mean, the history of the United States, um, it, it's the lack of any sort... Well, again, this is about a crisis of liberalism, the lack of an understanding that, yeah, you have a point, I have a point, maybe I'll win this election, but it's, it's okay if you win the next one, because we're all in this together, and at some point these things will reach some sort of synthesis, as opposed to right. we have to win everything now, and your existence is a direct threat to right. us, which occurs on both sides, a sort of tribalization. You know, when you're in that illiberal kind of context in the culture, then it's no surprise to me that free speech in campuses become so difficult to, to construct or mediate because we've lost even the sense that we're all about maintaining this liberal democracy as opposed to other values. Well, and then once in a while people come along and try to hear different sides and, and uh, try to find some new frameworks for, for civil discussion of the great issues, and that's what, one of the things we're we're hoping to do. Well, but maybe, maybe, not, maybe, maybe there's naive. a way forward. Maybe there's a way forward in right. this. And I hope, for God's sake, I hope so. I just find the rhetoric on both sides becoming so polarized sure. that it makes the possibility of even believing you might be enlightened by the arguments of someone else almost unthinkable. Right. It, increasingly, it's like, oh my God, I might be contaminated. Right. I, I heard Bill Clinton give a speech recently, a sort of magisterial yet low key talk at Georgetown University in which he said that he thought the extreme partisanship was poisoning our democracy. It's, it's, the trouble is not just partisanship, it is, it is a much broader social identity which is built upon race, uh, religion, and geography. Um, in other words, you're, you're part of this party if you are this color, this gender, uh, 
uh, and not, I mean, you know, I mean, Virginia was interesting this last week um, because the racial divides are just as intense as they were uh, when Trump is elected. Nothing has changed. It's just a question of the balance of who showed up <laughs> has shifted. Right, right. Well, and that's sometimes what makes the difference is. Abs absolutely. But, but in fact, the Republican margin in Republican areas increased. Evidence of the polarization. Ever, ever more. And it's the, hu it's the biggest. Th when you're in a war like that, when you're in a tribal war, the notion of free speech is incredibly suspect, the way it is in all wartime. It's propaganda, right? It's dangerous. It could undermine morale. Uh, uh, we, and so, for example, I compare a recent piece I did, to this, the concept of whataboutism, which is you don't actually exchange a, a, an argument about an issue, but you immediately think of somebody on their side that did something similar to what they're now criticizing, and you just talk about that. Um, it reminds me of the way in which the Soviet Union, when confronted with its human rights abuses, would say, well, what about racial unrest? Right. That's a device that the two countries at war with one another used against each other rhetorically that we now use against each other. It's now within us because we're actually two countries right. at war with each other, in which case the idea of speech becomes dangerous to both sides. And maybe what we need first is a ceasefire, a good old-fashioned ceasefire. Well, I know we've been trying for it forever, but it, I mean, Obama came in and said, I'd like to have a truce. I really would. And you don't, didn't get a more eloquent messenger of a truce than he, in my opinion. Um, au contraire, it got worse. It didn't happen. It got well, worse. So if he can't right. do it, who can? Thank um, you, Andrew. Oh, you. You're very welcome. We've been discussing the free speech crisis in America with Andrew Sullivan from New York Magazine. To learn more about Georgetown University's free speech project, please visit our website. Thank you for watching. I'm Sanford Unger.